as we go. So thank you so much for joining us for this uh, special open forum and Q&A. Um, my name is Margaret Dawson. I'm the VP of Portfolio Product Marketing at Red Hat. And with me is Paul Cormier, who's our President of Products and Technologies, and Arvin Krishna, who's the SVP of Cloud and Cognitive Software at IBM. So thank you both for joining us. Pleasure to be here. I'm. Yeah. Thank you. So we have a few questions uh, that we received through the app. So thank you to those of you that uh, pre-populated that. Uh, and I have a couple of my own. And then we're going to open it up to all of you. So start thinking about questions now. You have a few minutes to process and get thinking about uh, some questions. Um, and, and I'm going to start, Arvin, with your favorite question, because we've only had this question to you about 1,046,000 times, I think, uh, which is, why Red Hat? We heard Ginny talk about this a little bit yesterday. Yes. I'd love to hear from your opinion. You know, $34 billion investment. I know you were really crucial behind that. What, what were you thinking? Well, I'll get... <laughs> So I'll give the two to three minute answer, not my two hour answer or the 20 hour answer, because the, people have asked me those for that long also. We're not the DOG, so, you're, you're so, okay. So if you just uh, step back a little bit from uh, products per se, the world goes through a computing evolution, you can debate whether it's every 10 years or every 20 years. And right now we're going through a cloud um, architectural revolution on uh, computing. When you think about cloud, now the question is, what is cloud? So cloud is comprised of helping people on their journey to cloud, and it has private cloud, and it has public cloud. As always in these, there becomes a debate of what is the fabric through which you do it. Are you going to go through one of these, and then there's an island unto itself? Or is there an opportunity for a fabric that can go stretch across and give you freedom and flexibility while giving you all the positives of ease of use, of easy deployment, of automation, of monitoring, what people call, quote unquote, it's a service, as opposed to installable software. And what they mean by it's a service is that something in the infrastructure manages it. It keeps it up, it keeps it with the correct response times, it, it'll go forward as to back it up, it'll do all those things. And people want that experience both in their private clouds and their public clouds. Mm -hmm. And then we believed very firmly that that basis should be, not can be, but should be Linux, containers, Kubernetes. And then you look at it and you say, so which company has the best portfolio across those three? And I would turn around and say, that's Red Hat. And then how do you bring all the other workloads? How do you help clients with their journey? How do you improve this? But also, this is going to be something that is going to bring incredible value to all of our mutual clients over the next, I think, two to three years. That's when you got to go do this. So it's not just the rationale, but it's also then the timing of doing it now. So Paul, I feel like he just defined open hybrid cloud. Totally. Um, so did Red Hat my, need my, IBM? My work is done. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly, that was my question, is that, so did Red Hat need IBM to actually achieve open hybrid cloud? Does this change the vision or story, or what does this mean? So no, it doesn't change the vision or story. Um, but yes. Um, we need it. I mean, I, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. I said, you know, if, if you came to the keynote this morning, what I, what I talked about is, you know, we are in a transition. We are in, I don't know if it's a 10 or a 20 year transition, but we have these cycles. I, I, I won't tell you how old I am, but I've been through a, a few of them, right? And, and we're in the middle of that cycle, and we've been in the middle of that cycle for a long time. But, you know, it took time for this to get steam. It started with Linux and adoption of Linux and adoption of open source and the associated technologies around that. And, and now that it's very, very clear to everyone in the industry that it's going to be a hybrid world, it's going to be built on Linux, it's going to be built on the technologies and the innovation that is, is predominantly being done around Linux and via open source, it frankly is going to happen. The deployments are going to happen over the next two to three years. I think IBM, the combination in terms of the reach in, that they have in the go-to-market on both the go-to-market side as well as the services side, I think that will explode the opportunities for us. I mean, I'm biased. I personally think we have the right portfolio at the right time. Now we, we get big enough to, to cover that in every corner of the planet. 
That's great. One of the things that I think we've all learned is uh, a lot more about IBM and open source. So can you talk more about you know, the commitment <coughs> IBM has and, and what open source means to IBM with or without Red Hat? Sure. So I'm actually going to go and explain a little bit. So Ginny made a comment for like a brief uh, couple of seconds on System R. So System R was 1974. And the researchers who invented the relational database got the usual skeptical look from everybody else because the other databases at the time were all hierarchical. So the relational guys came around and they said, you can do this, and they're doing funny math, and they're trying to prove all this stuff. And people kind of look at them weird and say, this shit is not going to work. <laughs> so what do smart engineers do when they're told it's not going to work? They prove that it will work. <laughs> and they wrote this thing called System R, and then, but who's going to use it? Because everybody inside was using something else. So they just gave it out to the community. By the way, System R, you should go look it up, became the basis of almost all relational databases at the time. Now, of course, over the next six to eight years, they evolved massively away from just the original, and that was the very first one. Mm -hmm. But then if I go forward to 95, um, Paul and I had this discussion. I mean, people remember Apache. Apache was a project at one time, not just a collection of things, and the Apache web server was circa 95. By the way, the booming company at that time was Netscape, and then there was Internet Explorer, and then there was, I forget, I think Sun also had something. And we inside looked at it and we said, hey, this doesn't make any sense. This looks pretty damn mature. Use this, and we started contributing into Apache web server for whatever mm -hmm. we were doing around, around those set of technologies. You can then fast forward to 98 and 99, when we made the investment in Linux, Actually, if I remember, you came out with Enterprise Linux in 2001? End of 2001, right? Right. We started saying, hey, Linux is ready for the enterprise in 98 and 99 because, yeah, it was going to be a journey, but we could see the path. And we made a ton of investments and engineering contributions into the upstream in order to get it ready for the enterprise. You can go to Eclipse, and mm -hmm. it always has the same pattern. You need a very wide ecosystem. You need to contribute a lot to open source, not just take from it. And you need to have open governance. And sort of, you can say, why Eclipse? Because we looked at it and we said, hey, people need a IDE. And if you don't make that IDE open, then it'll be constrained to whatever the one company can take. So you should put it out there. It gets wide adoption. Everybody can put in whatever they want. There'll be various flavors and these things. That's the wide ecosystem. It has to be open, otherwise, why will they ever trust you? And then you can go begin to get that the complete uh, sort of, uh, what is it, the rising tide, right? Lifts everybody, and then you gotta go compete for your share of the business if there is any. So we can go on and on with these examples, but it gives you a, a real flavor. I mean, I hear Paul always say that Red Hat is an enterprise software company with an open source development model. So in this case, we are also an enterprise software company, but we leverage open source when it makes sense, and that's what we have done for a long time. So you brought something up that IBM has been basically committed to Linux since almost when we first came out with our enterprise product. Talk a little bit more, Paul, about the partnership, because I think one of the things that has come out of um, the acquisition news is the fact that we, we've been working together as two companies for some time. What, what does that look like? Well, as Arvin was sort of going at, we've been working together upstream mm -hmm. as, as, as developers and as engineers for a long time. I mean, you, you may have even been in it before Red Hat into, into mm. upstream, but if not before, certainly they were very close at the same time. And so we've, we've, we've been through that. I mean, you may even have, at one time, I'm not even sure now, you, you, at one time you, might, you definitely had more engineers working in the upstream kernel than we did, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we've, we have a long history of that. We've had a partnership with the hardware group from day one. Um, as a matter of fact, the reason why R&D for us is headquartered here in, in Boston is because when we first came out with RHEL, we got a contract to bring it to IBM's hardware platforms, mm -hmm. and I needed 11 uh, enterprise class experienced kernel engineers overnight, and the only place they were were either here or the Bay Area, because DAC, HP, all of those, right. and that's, that's why we're here, because of that first IBM contract. I thought it's because you didn't want to travel the road. Oh, no, it had nothing to do with it. <laughs> nothing to do with it. And then, and, and, we, and even today, we, we go to market together. We, right. we, many, many customers out there only buy through IBM, and we, we use that as a channel 
to go to market with, with many of those partners. Um, and so, so we've had it, a relationship from, you know, an upstream relationship from the longest time, a commercial relationship with each other between the hardware group and our products, and a go-to-market uh, relationship from that same time till, till now, even. And what are you finding that customers are asking you most frequently about the, the partnership, you know, where it is today and what they can expect? I, I think what we get asked all the time is, is our model going to change? Right. And, it's in, and I think Arvin's made it clear a hundred times. I have. I think Ginny kind of settled it last <laughs> night. You know, uh, quote Ginny, you know, I, I didn't take a death wish to uh, invest $34 billion to screw it up, I think is right. kind of what she, I mean, that's how, in my words, maybe, but. <laughs> pretty, pretty <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think that's how she said it yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> and so um, that's, what we get, that's what we get all the time, and, and, right. and why would we? I mean, in, in order for this, we've proven that the model flourishes in an open environment. We've proven that the industry's going here. We're gonna have, we have partners today that in some cases we're, we're gonna, they could compete with IBM and compete with us as well. And that's, we all have to learn to work in that model now going forward, because that's what mm -hmm. customers want. That, that's, I mean, you, you heard Satya last night, even from Microsoft right. say, our customers gotta, I mean, Microsoft and us weren't exactly the best friends way back in the day, and our customers brought us together. And so we all have to listen to our customers here. And so that's why I think the model, our model is gonna, gonna stay the same because it takes a company that's neutral to be able to really build out that hybrid cloud across all the vendors that are yeah. out there. Did you wanna add anything to that? Look, I mean, uh, to just, I can add detail because what Paul stated is what we said when we announced the deal and has been what we have uh, reiterated uh, every time we're asked the question. If you just think for a moment, a little bit rationally and economically, because that's where Ginny went with the, hey, it's a $34 billion debt, because if I do anything different, the value of Red Hat lies not in IP per se, right? Because the IP is open source at the end of the day. Now, all that said, there is a lot of, I think, intellectual horsepower, which is more than just IP, which is around it. So I don't take that lightly. There is a lot of intellectual horsepower, which helps contribute to the products and in the value they get to the clients. But the, but the, sheer volume, the proliferation of Linux, and then of containers, and then of these fabrics and platforms, comes how? It comes because you support everything that it could possibly run on without picking, without favoring one over the other. So, yep, you're going to run on Intel. Yep, you're going to run on Amazon. Yes, you're going to run on Azure. Yes, you're going to run on IBM. Paul talked about supporting IBM hardware. They also supported at one point, uh, 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 Solaris, I'm mean, not not Solaris. The the Spark processor yeah. with Linux. So you uh, go across arm. this arm, arm right. today, right? And uh, so as you go across this, you need the widest possible flavor. And to me, this is the beauty of these 20 year shifts. The internet was that you sort of got away from tying the networking standard to the physics of the wires in that day. Here. Linux becomes the abstraction, hmm. and then containers and Kubernetes on top of it to abstract out what is the exact infrastructure physics. So you do that, but in order to get that value, that has to be completely preserved. So you can't have a Red Hat suddenly saying, oh, I prefer IBM hardware. That's not gonna happen. So Red Hat will be independent and will maintain what makes sense to have the widest possible base, and that's why we say it'll be as it is before. And the way Red Hat interacts with clients, you probably heard half a dozen times yesterday the word co-innovation come up on stage again and again. That's got to be preserved. And that is a methodology then that has to be preserved in the client-facing functions of the company. And that is why the two sides of it'll go on as before from Red Hat side have to be uh, kept accurate. That's great. So multi-architecture, multi-cloud, open always. Excellent. So one of the questions we received was about um, future features and development, um, and I, we'll see how much we can say here. But do you expect um, future features or development in cloud platforms to be available through both sales forces as well as both companies' products? I'm not sure what we can say around that, but they were curious what that might look like in the future. Um, I mean, I, I can tell you that you know, we haven't been able to deeply plan Right. right, we've been able to do some planning, but 
we haven't been able to deeply collaborate with each other. But I think the general, the general rule, I think, stop me if I'm wrong, I mean, the, the general rule here is Red Hat Salesforce will continue to focus on just Red Hat products, and that's the way we are now. And, you know, frankly, over the years, especially as RHEL has grown, I must get asked three times a week if our Salesforce could sell a partner's product. Or, and right. we've, never, we've never done it, and, you know, I don't think we're going to start now. So Red Hat will focus on Red Hat products. IBM, IBM, Salesforce will be incented to, to, uh, to bring in Red Hat products. When we say bring in Red Hat products, in most cases, they'll probably bring in the Red Hat Salesforce with it to yes. finish the deal. So I think it's, I think the way you said it, um, um, you can be opinionated, IBM can be opinionated, we can't, Red Hat can't. And so, from a Salesforce Great. perspective. I mean, anything, I anything you wanna add to, add to that or? No, I think, look, I mean, <clears throat> As Paul began by saying, we cannot do deep planning, which means we can't really have engineers sit down and talk about product plans. That's not, that's not going to happen until we get to, to closure and regulatory approvals. So there's actually very little we could right. say on that perspective. Now you just step back and say rationally, right? Now you look at it and you say, Red Hat has built a great business building products that are based on open source. So you would expect that as that velocity increases in that world, those capabilities will come much more into into Red Hat products. I mean, that's just the nature of what seems the rational and the correct thing to do for client value. I think IBM products will then go optimize themselves to Red Hat's products because they tend to be by and large complementary. Red Hat is much more at an operating system, infrastructure, fabric level. IBM has traditionally been very heavy on middleware and databases and analytics and business intelligence mm -hmm. and asset management. You look at those lists and you say they're completely complementary. Yeah, the stacks actually so, work together. So we, and by the way, they have worked together for 20 years. That's why we have had all these engineering and go-to-market uh, partnerships. Uh, there's probably more, uh, even on the mainframe, uh, which is uh, a, quite a mature architecture, I think there's probably more capacity on Linux than on anything else, which is, which is surprising to most people. So these are complementary. So, but you do expect that, hey, we'll, work on post-close, trying to make them more and more optimized and engineered to work together. Not force fit to work together, just engineered to work together. That's great. But it, we, I mean, just to add, from, yeah. from our platform perspective, other partners that may or may not compete with IBM will have the same platform available that for them to build right. their solutions on top of. I mean, we have, to, we have to maintain the trust in our partners. And so I think that's really important. Uh, to be able to, to, to keep going where we're going. That's great. Do we have any questions in the audience? I can't actually see. Are we, can we move Your the mic? Hands. Yeah, we can take the mic. <clears throat> there was two right over here. Hi, I had a question about, um, for your teams on the Red Hat side, and kind of do they share your um, optimism and excitement and especially as you get closer to that, you know, closing date, um, what do you think would be best to kind of communicate to them and, and help them really be on board for this next chapter? How we communicate to our Red Hat people inside mm -hmm. of Red Hat? Correct. Well, um, when we first announced this, um, Ginny went to headquarters in Raleigh with Jim and stood in front, and Arvin came to uh, products headquarters mm -hmm right down the street here in Westford, Mass, and we stood up together and said, ask at us. Uh, we have uh, regular uh, meetings at least every three weeks or so uh, where we communicate with everyone and where we are to date. In many cases, we say, well, we, can't, we don't know this yet because we're still into regulatory process, but we still, we still say where, where we are. And um, I think it's just, it's just gonna be more than that. It's not gonna be new for us. This is kind of how we do it. I mean, personally, in my group, um, in Red Hat, I mean, products, products group is about 7,000 people inside of Red Hat. I have a quarterly business review with my staff every quarter. Everybody knows, oh, everybody's in town this week. What are they talking about? At the end of that, we have an all hands meeting and say, here's the agenda we went through. That will continue. I mean, so, I can tell you nothing has changed, and, and I think the core message has been nothing will change, especially culturally. So we have something called memo list, which is an internal email alias where anything goes. You're allowed to say anything. And I can tell you everything has been said on memo list, and that is going to continue to be allowed. And I think that's, that's the critical part, and that's right. what we keep talking about is the culture. Um, you know, because things change just, I mean, 
products and things will change regardless, right? I mean, it's, it's a very dynamic industry, and I think that's the part that we really emphasize. You know, the interesting thing with us as a company, um, I say, Arvind said, I, sorry, I say we're an enterprise software company with, a develop, with an open source development model, but we were an open source developer company before we were an enterprise software company. Right. And the way that it works in open source development, you know, title doesn't make you the smartest person in the room and the best idea wins, but that permeates all through what we do. So everybody's, everybody's entitled to throw an idea on the table or disagree with an idea that's on the table. Right. And trust me, everybody takes advantage of that. I think it's also the accessibility. I will tell you, you mentioned Ginny and Arvin coming to those. It has been an incredibly transparent process, as much as we can be, right, within the regulatory reality. But I think that has um, made a big difference for employees. And you continue to be very accessible, which I really appreciate. Hey, if the engineering cultures on both sides are not that different, right. I mean, if I sign up in some of our R&D places and we go talk to the engineers, I mean, they're pretty damn transparent and they will say anything and they will debate anything. That's the nature of those cultures. That's right. So that's uh, going to be this thing. So it's a question again of, but it works. At the end of the day, it all works together as a collection. So you'd want to preserve that and you'd want to enhance that going forward. And I think people, my, my view, people are waiting and watching to say, hey, do the actions line up to the words? Right. And as that gets reinforced every month and more and more, okay, you're going to be transparent. Are you transparent? Okay, you're transparent. Oh, you said you were going to do this. Yeah, okay, you did this. You said that you were going to have this event, for example, the same way. Okay, you did. Right. I think as we go do that every month and every month, then that reinforces the belief because it builds trust that, yes, this model is going to keep working. Great. There was a question somewhere right in here. Sorry, it's hard to see in these lights. Yeah, the lights are a little bright, so you can't see <laughs> us probably. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Bishwa. I am from India, from a mid-sized bank called Indusind Bank. Uh, I manage technology there. So um, my, I have two questions, really, for Paul and, uh, and Arvind. Uh, the first question is um, a little bit uh, on the hardware side, because I know you are representing, Arvind, the, the software side of the IBM business. Uh, but let me uh, state that IBM has been very aggressive with deep roots in Many of the banking organizations who have, uh, you know, the power series, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is a legacy hardware, but uh, even though it's legacy, we have refreshed the hardware in many of these organizations. We continue to do that because many of our core applications run on that, right? Now, uh, fundamentally, um, there is a odds between moving to a open source kind of a model uh, on the Linux side vis-a-vis -vis the AIX-based power series model, right? Yeah. Uh, so the first question really I had is, how are you going to look at your sales organization's incentive uh, so that they do what is right for the client? As opposed to, you know, we sold you this, so could keep uh, using this. But by the way, we also have this from Red Hat, so you buy A plus B, right? So that was my question for number one. Uh, the other question, of course, is what Rahul Saman mentioned yesterday, is that from a licensing perspective, we are going to be very badly... Um, doomed if we are going to be looking at subscription on one side and you know perpetual licensing on the other side based on PVC, you know uh, PVUs and all the complex calculations you guys do so uh, at some point in time there has to be some thought process given to it in the planning cycle so um, just these are the two questions i had so if you could articulate Great. thank you so much Arvind. okay Take i think i'll start <laughs> so so on the first one so just um, I think I'm going to look at Paul. When did we put Red Hat Linux on the Power Series boxes? Early 2000s? Uh, well, yeah. Two, yeah. Probably before REL even, I think, right? So 2001, 2, 3, somewhere there. Yeah, early. Very, uh, that's, I mean, uh, that, that is exactly why I, when I gave my story of moving up here, I needed 11 kernel engineers to do yeah. this overnight. So, so, uh, so, so to address it very, very seriously, so... So you asked on power, but I'm going to begin with Z because that will give you a sense of power, and then I'll address it on power. On the mainframe, we offer two main operating systems, ZOS and Linux. Mm -hmm. In Linux, actually, we are also openly, we offer both uh, SUSE and Red Hat. And they come from those, and the sales team that goes to the client actually has all three in their kit bag. They are not biased about one versus the other. It is based on what does the client want to do, right? Ditto on power. They actually have the same three. They have AIX in that case, not ZOS, mm -hmm. and they have Red Hat Linux, and they have SUSE. Now, I think on power, the majority is Red Hat Linux and AIX. The sales team is not going to be biased about it. They should do whatever is good for the client on that piece of hardware, and we are not confused. There are so many of our clients who depend upon those 
that both of them are going to keep going forward. And I point it to ZOS because in the mainframe, as the room knows, for 20 years we have kept the momentum going on both. And ditto on power, we're going to keep the momentum going on both because that's the nature of, as you describe your workload, it depends upon that. And that's why we use that word mission critical workload. Okay? So I hope that addresses the first question. On the second one, this is a, I'll, I'll say, what Rahul asked for was, I think, a little bit different. Your question is much, I think, much more pointed and much more straightforward. You're on the licensing metrics. I think that as the world is moving forward, we got to think deeply that when the products work together, as I kind of said, hey, they're complementary, we got to get to some common licensing metrics that will then allow them to be consumed like that. And so is it going to be more of a, a term license model? Is it going to be more subscription? Because term license is a, just another way of saying subscription. Mm -hmm. I think we got to think through that as opposed to just uh, a perpetual license. So those are some of the things. But by the way, it's not just Red Hat. The moment you go to cloud consumption, because you do put your products up for being consumed in the cloud, you kind of get faced with the same questions. And so we have to do that. It can't just be BY, bring your own license anymore. But uh, more on that probably a month or two after we close, as opposed to right now. But, but one contract is a place I would sort of pause. I'm not so sure. Because we need to maintain the independence of Red Hat. So I don't want to put those products into an IBM contract. So separate contracts, but I agree with the question, hey, you need to get to some similar licensing metrics. I mean, the other thing, I'm not going to touch any of the hard work yeah. questions, right? <laughs> but the other thing around, around the subscription model, the subscription model is not only a model that um, customers have wanted to consume in for a long time, but it was also a model that many software companies are trying to get to. We sort of had an advantage because we get to start with a clean sheet of paper. It's really hard for a company that's in a, a license model to move to a subscription model in terms of revenue recognition. That's the first thing. Right. Second thing is the subscription model, in order to be adherent with most open source licenses, especially the GPL, you have to do something like a subscription model because the bits are free, right? So that's something that, it's all, it, this is complex. And we, we've, as Arvind said, we, we need to work through it. The third thing is, as he also said, as we move to the cloud, many customers are asking for consumption type models, and we've actually done so, a lot of work around that. We, we, you can buy RHEL by the hour on, in, in the cloud today, which is a, a different model than if you buy it on premise. So I think we all, as software vendors, have to continually look at morphing those models as times change, and we're in one of those big cycle changes, as we keep saying. And I've got tongue in cheek. I mean, you actually began with the permanent license model and moved, because when you sold shrink wrap software, in the sense, when you bought the box, it was a perpetual license. But there was a lot of complications with that. <laughs> it was. That's tough to scale. It was a that. huge disruption <laughs> right. at the time, too. It's tough to scale of, that, though. Yeah, right. right. So, right. so th I think the only point we're making is we all sort of go through these evolutions depending upon the size and the scale. They're a little bit complicated sometimes, but we kind of recognize what we all have to get done. Thank you for your question. Other questions? This is your time. I can't see hands, so. All right, I will ask one while you are all thinking about it. So we hear a lot about the OS being commoditized or hardware being commoditized. Um, clearly, we've talked a lot about Linux this week, uh, and even IBM you know, has been a lot in it. Can you just speak to that question, um, Paul, about why, why is the operating system in Linux specifically still so important and, and for innovation? I mean, the operating system is the base of what applications ride on, and, and that's, um, that's um, really important and in order in what customers want. You know, now that we've got these different deployment models, physical, virtual, private cloud, multiple public clouds, if you build out to each of those platforms in a vertical stack, you're gonna have five islands on your hand. It's impossible for the developers to switch context in five different ways. It's impossible for the operations people. It's impossible for the security people, et cetera. Giving that common platform is what we do with RHEL. In terms of it, it being a commodity, uh, I think we've shown that it's, it's more than just the bits. If we've proved anything here over the last 17 years, it's more than just the bits. And I think this is one of the biggest confusions out there today, mm -hmm. the difference between a project and a product. A project is an, upstream, is an upstream development project, Linux, Kubernetes, Hadoop, things like that. A product are things like RHEL, where we take that, we build it there, we continue to build it there, and we put a life cycle around it, we manage it. I'm, I'm meeting with one of our OEM partners in an hour that wants to extend our 10-year life cycle to a 15-year life cycle. 
Hmm. And so that's what, that's what the subscription model is all about, and that's why it's not a commodity. Enterprises can't uh, consume an upstream tree. That's a pre, pre, pre alpha uh, development phase. In traditional software development, who would have ever thought of bringing a pre alpha tree into production? And that's, frankly, I think that's one of our biggest challenges is to help people understand that as the model. So um, it's the development model, not the end thing. It's, it's, it's a verb, not a noun. Anything to add to that? I got nothing to add. I mean, like, this is so clear <laughs> to me. When you talk about, I'll just pick one of those things, just security. The fact that you can you know, call somebody and say, look, this CVS1, CVS1 vulnerability happened. When are you going to fix it for me? I mean, if you go to most upstream projects, I mean, sometimes they get fixed, sometimes they don't. I mean, our friend there said that he comes from a bank. Many of our clients come from banks, they come from regulated entities, they come from insurance companies, they come from healthcare companies or telecoms or governments. You gotta fix these things like quickly. So you gotta depend upon somebody to come support it. So when Paul sort of mentioned uh, sort of enterprise capabilities, that's just one of them. And then that says that, that Indeed, it leverages open source, but it's not just open source. It is all of those other capabilities being brought to life. All that said, it has to be at the right price. It's not going to be, you can't get usurious about what you charge for these things, um, given that there are alternatives. That's great. Why are you both so bullish on Kubernetes? How do we know that's just not the latest hype? I feel like both companies have just gone all to, in. To, it's happened fast. Right but it's too far down the road. And, and, and this, is how, this is why community is so important. The reason why Kubernetes has won and will win is because the upstream community has gotten so big and around it. And that's, that's the key. And that's something that we've had to do from day one is pick the right time to jump into the right community at the right level. There's so much momentum behind it right now, mm -hmm. that's why it's, it's the winner. I mean, we sort of picked right and maybe got a little lucky. You know, we've, we've, we picked it five years ago. We chose to mm -hmm. get, you know, fully behind that, just like we did with KVM over right. Zen. And, and once you get momentum on that community, the innovation goes so far and so fast that the other competing communities can't keep up with it. Right. And maturity. And we, maturity. Run, we run about I think if I remember correct, 13,000 clusters of uh, Kubernetes clusters at IBM today. Hmm. They run like lights out. I mean, there's probably a handful of people who manage all of them. How many pieces of uh, software that are uh, less than a decade old in this case, and actually four or five in the public eye, I think, in this instance, uh, can you say that about? So that gives us that. We did scale tests to see hey, can you actually, all the claims being made, can you actually go scale it and run it at 100,000 servers with all those issues that I'll say some of us geeks worry about? Hey, do I get into a left brain, right brain issue? Do I get into a thinking issue? Can I actually scale to all of the things that I might need to do in the fabric? So having done all that, it gives you a lot of confidence that this can go, but I couple it to the open governance also. If a single company had controlled all of it and controlled the destiny, that would have been a tough choice to make. So what do you think is the next big thing? Do you see uh, you know, the next Kubernetes or something you're really excited about that's happening out there in the communities? Well, I mean, Arvid talked earlier about the fabric. We think, yeah. we think, we think the fabric, uh, especially as we scale out with containers, um, I mean, containers are changing the way applications are being built. I mean, containers are microservices. They have, to, mm -hmm. they have to talk to each other. They have to be managed together. They have to link together. They have to share resources together. I think all around that, um, especially the management around that, the security around that. Those are all things that are things that are being worked on and solved, you know, being solved right now. I mean, we've got so much to do, which is great. I mean, guys like us like lots to do like that, but that's, that's, those are really the, the next day. We've, you know, we've just scratched the surface in building out hybrid cloud. There's so right. much more and power we can bring to this. I'll just throw, I mean, like, I mean, Paul went down the fabric path. I mean, one of the components in there that I'm really excited about is Istio mm -hmm. and what it does. And then what I think um, Red Hat has done and taken back to the community around operators. You combine those two with the power of what we're already talking about, and I think it really, really improves productivity and security 
and um, the whole notion of a service mesh, I think, is going to come to life pretty quickly mm -hmm. with all of these. You know, it's, it's a good point. You know, the, the operators thing, we think we're, we're really bullish on that too. But the thing about operators, in the, 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 with operators, is it's making it easier for developers that don't happen to be deep into the bowels of, a, of the Linux operating system to build and take advantage of the power of containers. Right. I mean, I talked about a, a little bit about this earlier, one of the other presentations is Linux has grown so fast that, um, that Linux, the, the Linux developers available, the true deep Linux developers available in the market can't keep up fast enough. Hmm. So, not, so it's our job to make it easier for, same on the operators side, it's our job to make it easier for the developers and the operators as they get up to speed, make it easier to build, deploy, manage their applications and containers on these platforms. That's great. Really? Yes. Question. Shy crowd. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name's Pierre Fricky. I work at Rackspace, and I have more of a comment in support of the culture uh, commonality that y'all said. I had the honor of working at IBM more than 10 years and the honor of working at Red Hat more than 10 years. Uh, and so I've been on both sides. And I just want to say something about my experience as being less than, lower, less than a director level, I uh, was on the uh, Lou Gerstner transformation teams, uh, Ellen Hancock's teams and some of those. You probably remember some of those names. Uh, and um, my voice was heard all the way up to Lou. And the debates were every bit as heated and polite afterwards. We had the heated <laughs> debates. We had the heated debates. It wasn't, it wasn't memo list. We had the heated debates, but we went out after as, as friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so I think, at least when it comes to openness and working together, I think it's a, it's a good fit culturally because I enjoyed the time at both places. Well, thank you. Thank Here. you. Thank you for that comment. Questions right here. Hello. The question I have is, as you said, is a transition happening, an evolution in, in the computing industry, right? And we remember Y2K, what happened, a lot of applications were there, they were, the customer start looking at it when they were really hitting the deadline, right? And thought they would migrate and transform off it, but tech, it doesn't, didn't happen that much in 25 years, those apps are still there, those business apps. Even today, if you see the enterprise legacy like mission critical application. They're trying a little bit, okay, this piece, that piece to move to cloud, but there's that uncertainty, there's that uh, reluctance, right? How do we do, like every time, you know, we go to a bank, I work for IBM, so first thing they will ask, what is a reference? Give me another reference who's running with the same benchmark, right? Similar type of application, they don't want to be the first one, right? And we as an IBM always kind of had that guinea pig type of experience with a lot of our good customers where we do that and we take that forward and saying here it has been done before right so i think that's what a lot of customers who are sitting out there are looking forward to that now with the partnership and saying what are you bringing on the table how we are convincing the cios and those companies that it is a right path and, and make that move right winning their confidence that's the question well let me say a couple things on that. In, in some respects, it's kind of the opposite a little bit today, a little bit, even though it, it kind of isn't, it kind of isn't, and I'll explain. So open source is so popular today, um, especially in the banks, the banks that have sometimes more kernel engineers than we do, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and so they know what projects are getting traction up there. They're running the raw projects in-house, in et cetera. They just don't know how to necessarily make commercial software out of it. So they're getting early exposure on these new technologies, right? So, so, so that, that's what's changed a, a bit. And so and you're right. People want to see who's, who's, the, who am I, who's running and give me some references, et cetera. But that's, that's almost a jump start on it because open source is, is, so, is so popular today. Um, but having said that, um, there's a lot of people that do have a lot of engineers that, um, that say, well, I can do it myself. It's open, so I'm just going to build it myself. And some of them even go down that path until the next Spectre meltdown bug happens, <laughs> and they don't know what to do. And that's when we can help them, right? So, so it's almost a, the open source community can almost, you know, the fact that it's, it's out there so much can also, also can almost be a curse to us and a blessing because mm -hmm. we have to sort of explain the difference between the upstream community and all of that stuff. But at the same time, it's a great lead 
for us. We just have to be um, we just have to be patient in some respects. I mean, look at even before Kubernetes, there I can think of three or four, maybe more other container orchestration mm -hmm. technologies. We picked Kubernetes and stayed down that path. All the others have fallen by the wayside. So, so that's, 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 that's one thing. And the second thing is you have to have a commercial footprint to get those references. The other thing customers like, if I'm a customer in Australia, I want a reference in Australia. And that's exactly where IBM can help us scale much faster than we might have in the past because what did, what did you say? We're in 50 countries and you're in how many? 190. 190. So we're in, play, in, 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 in those other 140, um, we're not even present yet. And so we can't give anyone, we're not even a reference to anyone. And so that's the combination of the upstream being so popular as well as the commercial side helping our customers consume it. The biggest challenge for our customers is consuming the technology upstream. That comes from upstream. Great. We have time for one or two more questions in the back. You talked a little bit about the effect of the culture on Red Hat. Arvin, what would you like to see from Red Hat's culture go over to IBM? Oh, there's a few things. I think, for example, this is one that I'll say is a somewhat pained example on my side. I think we do a lot of open source, but that's because we encourage open source. And actually, I look at Envy with what Paul and his team do as the discipline on open source, of actually understanding very cleanly and having the language that allows you then to frame a discipline. And they talk about the projects and the products. And they're very clear, by the way, which projects will become products. It's not that every project that somebody may touch in the middle of the night becomes a product. So I think understanding that, because, because that has been an ethos in the company for more than 20 years, is one that I would like to bring a bit more into IBM. So that's one for sure. The second, you know, when I heard the word co-innovation so many times yesterday on stage, not that that was news to me, I've known it for a few years, but I think it became much more visceral. It came to my heart, not just my head. And I began to think about, okay, how do we also uh, learn that as a culture uh, from the Red Hat team uh, to bring across? I think we do a fair amount of it, but I think making it deeply embedded in the culture is more than just saying that, okay, you do a fair amount of it. So those are two that I would say that just jump out at me. I think we're very good at doing really big, hard, transformational projects. But how do we begin to do core innovation even in, the, even in every touch point that we have with someone is something that I think could be learned. It's interesting you say that. Something that Jim Whitehurst says a lot is when he's with customers, he often hears the thing they like the most is that co-creation, co-innovation that we do together. So I don't know if you well, you know, but a lot of that well. comes from, as I said, because a lot of the, our, these customers are um, are involved in many of the upstream Absolutely. projects, at least familiar right. with. I mean, I, right. I can't honestly say there's a, there's a there's a lot of our customers are actually physically doing development in upstream but they're involved with it. They understand what's going on there. They're testing early drops of it from upstream, et cetera. And, and from that, they come back to us and tell us um, what they think they need in order to adopt this technology. That's why also it's so important for us that when we get involved in a community that we get involved in a big way. I mentioned in one of my other talks earlier, when, you know, when we decided to go to virtualization, we were initially on Zen and for a whole bunch of reasons, that community went in the, in the wrong direction, and we ended up buying a company, KVM, from, from, a, from an Israeli company called Kumernet. And I had to go to our board and say, I want to buy this company for $108 million. How much revenue? None. How much additional revenue? None, because it's <laughs> going to be part of RHEL. The reason why we bought it was so we could get behind the community to get strength in that community to move it forward. Because when our customers get familiar with these technologies, they start playing with them, but they say, you know what, if it only had we have to have the ability to go work that upstream to get that. It might not be the next day, but it's got to be in the roadmap of that community, and that's what we can do. That's a great point. One last question. All right, I'll ask it then, and we'll wrap this no, up. Oh, was one. there one? Yep. I, thank you, Arvind. So with um, computing evolving every 10 to 20 years, how does quantum fit into that next evolution? Mm -hmm. And then also, too, with Red Hat being part of IBM, does that give you the ability to impact how quantum is adopted? Yeah, 
So, so I'll begin actually with the latter part of your question first and then go to the former. So if you look at it, I began, not began, a few minutes ago I said that Linux really helped to abstract away the hardware infrastructure from the software. Just step back a little bit and we say we go on this fabric, which you've left a little amorphous because think of it as containers and Kubernetes, but all the management and all the security that you need. As you go forward, how will quantum get delivered? Quantum is a brand new hardware computing architecture. It functions at temperatures that are roughly 1,000 times colder than outer space. So this is not going to be a desktop computer in the next <laughs> few years. It's going to be a watch. <laughs> <laughs> right? Unless somebody comes up, it's possible. Physics doesn't say it's impossible, but you're not going to have a small thing. These are, let's call it room-sized computers. So it's, if it's a room-sized computer today and it's a new computing architecture and you need all that skill to run it, that says naturally it runs in a cloud infrastructure. That's the easiest way to deploy it. If we succeed in putting out these fabrics, wouldn't that be the natural place through which you get access right. to a quantum computer? Mm -hmm. And much like Linux allowed people to develop lots of things, I'm imagining that the software development paradigm of quantum computers could then make its way right there. Not the hardware, that's something separate, but if that sits right there, it exposes it to lots and lots of people. So the two together, I think, really can accelerate and expose back to the u -port. It's got to bring innovation to the people who use it. This is, could be one more dimension of innovation being brought to all those users. Hey, you want to be able to use that platform for the applications that need that platform, not for all the applications. So that means it's got to be, it's got to be within that mesh. You've got to have it accessible within that mesh. That's, that's what we're trying to do here. Awesome. So final question is, you guys really seem kind of like BFFs. I'm just curious. <laughs> um, do you like each other? As much? I, mean, it's, it's, I, I know you well, so it feels like you are genuinely enjoying each other. Yeah, I can honestly tell you, we. <laughs> it's kind of scary a little bit because we've been... <laughs> We've been kind of completing each other's sentences a lot. I wasn't so. going to say they were acting like an old married couple. That I, I want to I find a way to disagree with them, but I just can't. <laughs> no, it's great. Look, it's one of the reasons that I think we are sitting here together, right? I mean, um, we worked together for years. Um, we worked together even on containers and, um, and those platforms for a good year before um, announcing anything that was even more strategic. Our teams have continued to work together. We kind of see the world evolving in a similar way. And, and it sounds funny, but it's sometimes good to have different opinions because then you actually sit down, you thrash them out, you hash them out, you actually learn from each other and it improves your own thinking. And we do tend to do a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we started the partnership that we announced last year, a, a year before that. First meeting we had, we didn't agree on a lot. Um, what we, you know, in terms of the partnership. But then we started talking it through and, and got closer and closer. And within a, a couple of meetings, we, we really started saying, yeah, I say, you're right. And he said, yeah, yes, it works. And so that's kind of how the open source world works. You, you throw your real opinion on the table and you debate it. Perfect. Thank you both so much. And thank all of you.